do you have a scary story you would like to send my way? Go to AsTheRavenDreams.com slash submit or check the links down below. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'll jump right in. The story happened before lockdown, quite a while ago, but it made me paranoid for months afterward, and really opened my eyes to the surprisingly subtle tactics that some of these creeps will use, even go as far to pretend to be gay to put women at ease, as I suspect this man did. Also, sorry for the length of this story. In my city, there is a local dog park that is one, if not the only park, that will let you take your dogs off the lead, and is specifically for dogs and their owners. It's a short walk from my house, and has plenty of local dog courses that happen there. Some free, some paid, and so on. I'd gotten a standard poodle puppy earlier that year, and had been attending a variety of these classes, and visiting the park for a while, and I'd gotten to know, or at least recognize, most of the regulars and their dogs. I'd also experienced a few creeps, but none really stood out or terrified me like this one man did. I arrived at the park around four after work, and other obligations, like I usually did, and let my dogs off the lead, throwing some toys, practicing some training, saying hello to the other regulars who were also starting to arrive. Typical stuff, you know. After a while of walking around, I sat down on one of the benches on a small hill overlooking the park, and my doggies came to sit with me to get some water. As I was giving them a drink, I noticed a man approaching us. He wasn't trying to sneak up on me or anything, and when he saw that I had noticed him, he smiled and waved, greeting me from a distance, before he came up the hill. He seemed friendly, and I thought he was just walking by. Plenty of people cut through the park to the gate at the top to avoid taking the longer route around the block. One of my dogs is a collie named Belle, and she immediately started growling and barking at him. But I dismissed this and shushed her, because she is a rescue who was treated terribly by her last owner, and this is usually how she reacts to anyone that she doesn't know. But rather than go quiet at my command like she usually does, she just transferred to a low growl. The man finally came up to where I was sitting, but rather than continue past, he stopped and started talking to me. It was then that I noticed he spoke in a way typically associated with gay men. His gestures also implied this, and maybe it was me being biased, but this put me a little at ease and made me less suspicious. He was also dressing a little strangely. I remember it was humid, slightly windy, but he was wearing jeans, a hat, like the Peaky Blinders. I don't know how else to describe it, sorry. A large trench coat with what looked like layers underneath and a colorful scarf. He looked professional and well put together, with an expensive watch and shoes to boot. At least... I assume expensive from what I saw. He greeted me politely and complimented my dogs, and I returned his niceties, still wondering what he may have wanted. He then said that he had seen a dog by the entrance to the park, hadn't seen its owner, and was concerned. This immediately got more of my attention, and I asked what kind of dog it was. Although... I was not especially concerned, as it is an off-lead dog park, after all. Maybe it had just wandered a little way off, and its owner was sitting on a bench or chatting to someone. 
The man explained it was a Maltese poodle, and he had hung around a bit but not seen anyone tending to it. At that point, an older lady walking behind us with her dogs overheard and came over to ask about it as well. He explained what he had seen to her as well, and while they were talking, I got up and left, partly to check on the unattended dog, but also to give my dog Belle some respite as she hadn't stopped growling and was getting more agitated with the little group forming. Her and my poodle pup followed after me happily as I made my way, not bothering to look back, and I went down to where the man said he had seen the dog. I saw it and immediately relaxed. I recognized it and knew that the owner of the dog wouldn't be far. Sure enough, when I glanced around, I spotted him climbing up the steps from the little parking lot of the park. He had a golf bag with him, which was mainly why he stood out enough for me to recognize him. He would let his dog out to run up while he got his stuff, and then he would whack a few balls, which his little white poof would speed off to retrieve. It was honestly adorable. I then noticed the trench coat man appearing, and the woman he had been chatting to also arrived, and they went over and chatted to the golf bag guy, who seemed to confirm to them the dog was his. Trench coat guy glanced around, and when he noticed me, he immediately came over and told me the Maltese belonged to that man. I said that I know, and explained a bit about him. I figured that would be the end of our interaction. As I turned and went off to watch my pupper, now playing with some other dogs, while Belle watched quietly a little way off from me, but nope. This guy followed, falling into a stride next to me and introduced himself. I responded politely, but kept walking. He continued beside me now, suddenly chatting about how he was visiting from the Berg, which made sense why I had not seen him before, and then started talking about his family. He was gushing unprompted information at me, but I assumed he was just being friendly or an open person. Honestly, something about him just did not sit right with me, but I had no idea what. I had no reason to be suspicious, and I tried to be polite, which is why I didn't just tell him to go F off, hoping he would put it together by my unenthused response. He started asking me questions. How long had I lived in the area? Or was I just visiting? Did I come to the park often? Was my family also in the area? I answered vaguely, just because he was coughing up his life story didn't mean that I had to. My vague answers made him back off a bit, and he began gushing about himself again, telling me how his family were renting a house nearby and going so far as to give me the actual address before asking me, oh, where do you live? Now, I'm not stupid enough to give my address out to random strangers, so... I just said that I lived in the area and had been here for a while. His response was silence, and when I looked at him, he was just staring at me. It gave me the creeps. However, my gut started to twist a bit when he began again. More about himself. Followed by more probing questions about my life and details about where I lived. He was so casual and smooth about it, that I was really questioning myself for having such a paranoid feeling. But I definitely felt uncomfortable, and I made an excuse of needing to check on my dogs to literally run away from the man, and it worked for about three minutes, until, as I straightened up from petting my puppy and calling Belle over, I turned to see him standing right next to me again. That friendly, disarming smile on his face again. He complimented me on my dogs and said that he was sorry to bug me again. He said he hadn't seen a poodle before and asked to pet my fluffy little pup. I was hesitant, but he was so smooth, seemingly kind and polite, 
I couldn't think of an excuse, and I said yes. He bent down to pet him and started asking me questions about him while littering and some compliments. It was disarming, and it made me feel a little bad. Like, maybe he wasn't such a creep and I was just being paranoid. I relaxed a little, and I answered some of his questions, but a comment of his made my gut twist all over again. He said that he would love to bring his dog here, and I blinked. Why wasn't his dog here? In fact, who goes to a dog park without their dog? My brain tried to justify it, but I froze a little as a wave of unprompted unease washed over me. I called Bell again as the man stood from petting my pup, and I scooped him up and took out Bell's lead. She came over, but when she noticed the man beside me, she lowered her head and hunched up her body growling as she did a half circle around us and to the left of me. I agreed with her at that point. This guy put up a perfect front, but something about him was off, and my gut was telling me to leave. I walked up to her, I hooked her up, and I told him that I was leaving and promptly strode off. I felt much better, but as I was walking, Bell was acting funny again, and twisting around. I refused to look back, I assured her verbally, and powered forward until I got to the stairs. Then, Bell suddenly began growling again, and it felt like a cold, hard ball had dropped into my gut when Trenchcoat Guy fell in step beside me going down the stairs. He didn't say a word and my brain tried to justify it as him just happening to leave at the same time as me, while my instinct screamed at me to get as far as I freaking could from this man ASAP. Whatever part of my brain had tried to justify the man leaving with me it went dead quiet when Trenchcoat Man proceeded to follow me through the parking lot to my car. I panicked and finally broke into a run, scrambling to get out my keys. I could hear a step speeding up behind me. I leapt to my car and popped Bell and my pup in, glancing up to see Trenchcoat Guy, now walking up to me and blocking my exit. The smile was gone from his face, and I was scrambling to get into my car when my hero, a true gift from above, intervened. Trenchcoat guy froze when my hero, a car guard, who had rounded the corner after us and who must have noticed me running away from this creep, yelled out to him. He jogged up to us, and he put himself between myself and the trenchcoat guy, who backed up and donned that smile again, that seemingly kind and innocent smile that now sent shivers through me. I wasted no time leaping into the seat of my car still in full panic mode, and speeding out of there, while Trenchcoat Guy and the car guards seemed to be arguing. I wasn't going to stick around. I practically left flaming tire tracks as I sped off, and home, the cold ball in my stomach growing heavier and heavier as I went over my interactions with the Trenchcoat Guy. The way that he spoke to me made me feel at ease, seeming to be worried about a lost dog to endear himself to me, willingly offering up personal information about himself to try to get me to open up to him, the probing questions, his overtly friendly and smooth demeanor, his strange clothes, my precious bells continued unease around the man, using my politeness to continue to stick around me, and finally, my gut instinct telling me that something was off from almost the start. Whoever that man was, he was a predator. And worse, he had been so discreet and subtle that he had made me question my instincts about him from the start. I had encountered plenty of flat-out creeps, some of which had attempted to follow me home, but this man and how he acted filled me with an unfathomed sense of fear. He was unassuming, cunning, and intelligent in his approach, which showed a carefully thought-out plan to get to me or other women. 
This made that man by far the most terrifying creep I have ever encountered, and it was months before I felt comfortable enough to go back to the park, now armed with a taser and pepper spray. The only upside to all this? The car guard who had intervened was there when I went back, and he approached me. I thanked him repeatedly, and he took my hand and said that if I ever felt safe, he would have my back, and that I was to come to him or his colleagues if anything like that ever happened again. I'd be lying if I said I hadn't cried a little. That man saved me, and he was alert enough to notice my distress. He helped me feel more secure going back to the park that I loved, that was almost entirely ruined by Trenchcoat Guy. I mentioned this story in a comment, and was told that I should do a full write-up. So, here we go. Sorry in advance if I'm not the best writer. All of this happened during my junior year of high school, in New Mexico, USA, 2006-2007. to My older brother had graduated the previous year, and was still living with us as I started my junior year. My mom had met a man at some point, I don't remember exactly when, and during the first few months of my junior year, she eloped with him. While she was eloping to her dream beach wedding in Texas, the man was Texan with a thick accent. This'll be important later. My brother assaulted me. I was tinkering with a dead computer tower, he comes downstairs to see this and starts beating me. I get away and run upstairs with him trailing me. He pulled on and ripped my shirt while I was trying to get away from him. Somehow, I did, and I barricaded myself in my room. I called my boyfriend at the time who lived four hours away. He was immediately ready with guns and friends and on the road. I called my mom to tell her what happened and that I was leaving. I still had a few hours to wait, though, and I was terrified. I started calling friends to see who I could hang out with until my boyfriend arrived. I found a friend to help me for those few hours. I don't remember how I got out of the house, nor do I remember the rest of that night. This started a trend of me missing a lot of school, and spending a lot of time with my boyfriend, avoiding my brother and eventually my stepdad, who we will call Jim. A lot of the time between the assault from my brother and that next big event is really blurry. I don't remember a lot, and come to find out from my therapist later in life, and this is because I apparently disassociate and didn't even know it. It's an additional defense mechanism to fight, flight, freeze. My brain is good at blocking out trauma. I don't remember much before the age of 13, and I've come to terms with not knowing why. Anyways, I digress. I do recall one piece of information. My mom spent weeks tracking down a shotgun that Jim had sold out of desperation. It was a family heirloom or something. She tracked it down, bought it at a pawn shop, and gave it to him for Christmas of 2006. He cried when he opened it. He also ended up putting it against my mom's head, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Sometime in the spring semester, I was at my boyfriend's house, four hours away, when I get a call from my mom. She says that she knows I'm heading home soon, but to not come home because she's staying at a hotel. She explains that Jim assaulted her in front of his family, threw his phone at her head, which needed stitches, and held the shotgun to her head. He was arrested at the house, but his parents, who witnessed the whole thing, bailed him out. So, my mom went into hiding. I get home, well, to the hotel in a nearby town, and this is where my mom explains further that the assaults have been happening for a while. 
and it always happened when I was at my boyfriend's house, and that she hid it. She also told me that Jim's sister stayed in the hotel with her for a day or two. Not sure why. My mom and I planned to stay there for a bit until... I'm not really sure anymore. We told nobody where we were or what was going on. This was my mom's idea. My grades were suffering, counselors had no idea what was happening with us, and I now realize how freaking stupid this was. One night, in the hotel, we were hanging out on our respective beds, watching TV, when the room phone between us rings. My mom mutes the TV and we watch it ring, glancing at each other. We didn't answer. Instead, we let it finish and my mom calls the front desk. The room was so quiet, I could hear the whole conversation and I will never forget it. The front desk said, Hello, how can I help you? My mom said, Did I just get a phone call? Yes, you did. Was it from a man? Yes. Did he have a Texan accent? Yes. My mom, then visibly shaken, said, Where did the call come from? To which front desk replied, Another room in the hotel. My mom paused before saying, Call the police. Call the police? Yes, please, call the police. I don't remember exactly what happened after that phone call, but I do remember hiding between the two beds on the floor with our old cat. We were on the first floor with our cars right outside the window. My mom said that this was to keep an eye on them, but I now think this was also a dumb idea. We had no idea if he still had the shotgun or not, so we were just hoping he didn't know where we were. After what felt like forever, the police knocked on the door. The knock was so startling, but so relieving when they announced that they were the cops. He was arrested at the hotel, and we proceeded to find out a lot of things. He was trying to find us. He hunted for us. The hotel had an internal balcony, so the second floor could look down and see the first. He was apparently just above us in a room or two over, he was calling the front desk complaining about our cat, with no valid complaint, to see what room the front desk would go to. Apparently he was also texting my mom during the whole thing, from his parents' phone since he broke his on my mom's head. He was saying how dumb we were for leaving our cars outside, how he knew where we were, how he would hunt us down and kill the mother lion and her cub. Demented shit. He even said some of this in a voicemail that my mom never let me listen to. We left the hotel for another, further from home. We couldn't sleep and around 3am, I left to go back to the safety of my boyfriend. Eventually, I came back to my hometown, but still did not go home. This time, we were staying with the family friend. Legal things were starting and I went with my mom at one point, in case they needed my statement, but they didn't. While we were staying with this family friend, my paternal grandmother passed from a heart attack. To say the least, my junior year was the most stressful year. After some time, my mom went back to Jim. He assaulted her multiple more times, and even tried to kill our cats. Eventually, she moved away from him, but was technically married to him from 2006 to 2014, 2015. Me now? I'm happy. I have a regular therapist, a supportive partner, and his family who loves me unconditionally. The trauma that I live with is a daily battle, but I'm in such a great place now. I no longer have contact with my mother, and it's the best decision I ever made. She later married another abusive man once her paperwork was done with Jim. I couldn't let her traumatize me further.
And to put you in the context, this story happened a couple months ago when I was on my way home. Typically, every day of the week, my mom, or my dad, come pick me up from school. Yes, even if I'm 17, and I'm from France, so... Driving below 18 years old, which is the majority there, is pretty much illegal. Sometimes my parents would go on a business trip or a vacation, and I would have nobody to pick me up. And I would have to take the bus, which didn't really annoy me that much. I like to play music and think during the ride. Basically, when class ends, I would walk with my friends to a place where all the buses gather and you can choose which one to take. I think everybody has a bus station in the city that they live in, but I don't know why, that day, I chose to do something different. To try a different trajectory from a different bus stop that would take me less time to go home. To have access to that bus stop, you had to go through a narrow street at the end of which you would arrive to the parking lot of an old block of flats, with a lot of little shops beside them. You have to know that it's a very commercial and busy place by day, with a lot of traffic. I had my headphones on, so I wasn't really paying attention, but I was walking by the pavement when a foreign blue car went straight toward me. It took me a second to realize what was going on, and I took a step back and went the other way, quickly. I didn't really pay attention to what just happened, because, you know, I thought, I was a weird guy who drank a little too much for the afternoon. A Piero, as we say in France. So, it didn't surprise me so much. I would just change the pavement and pursue my walk. Two minutes had passed, and... I started having a weird feeling like someone was looking at me or following me, and I didn't feel well, but I pursued my walk because I had almost arrived to the bus stop. Suddenly, I saw a blue car, which was running at a walking pace right by my side. My heart skipped a beat when I saw that it was the same blue car that had practically hit me a few minutes ago. Then, the window of the car rolled down, revealing the face of the blue car creep. I didn't really understand. I'm literally so clueless. He aimed at me and said, Hello. I didn't answer and kept going as if I didn't hear him. I had finally arrived to the bus stop and this creepy guy was gone. You know he's not gone because otherwise I wouldn't write this but I started to feel the exact same feeling I felt earlier when I was walking. I didn't really feel comfortable. Once again, I had that odd feeling of someone looking at me, and I wasn't really reassured, but I told myself that it was okay and that it was just an impression. I would love to have the story end there, but it wasn't just an impression. When I saw the blue car park right in front of me, I immediately knew that I had to go somewhere else, somewhere where he could not harm me in public. I was thinking that I noticed a small bakery with lots of elderly moms and their children, and I thought it would be a perfect hiding spot. So I went, and I pretended to wait in line. I scanned my field of vision to see if he was still there, but... I didn't see him, though I still had that bad feeling that someone was there somewhere hiding and waiting for me to come out of the bakery. So I kept looking, and I saw a big black truck next to the bus stop and thought he must be hiding behind it, waiting for me. And my instinct did not betray me. I could see the topmost of his head protruding from the truck. At this point, I couldn't really escape. If I chose to run, he would pursue me with his car, and I couldn't stay in the bakery forever. So, I thought of a plan. 
I knew that I had a bus at 12.07 p.m., and it was 12.05. I would wait in the bakery until I saw the bus arrive, and I would run to the bus, so he wouldn't have time to get to me. And that's what I did, and fortunately, I succeeded. But I did see him get into his car, and that was when I saw his face and body entirely. He looked really skinny. A lot of teeth were missing. I know this because he kept smiling at me with that creepy special face that only creeps know the secret of. Ugh. He hadn't much hair either, and he looked very filthy. And whatever he wanted to do with me did not reassure me at all. I put my hoodie on and tried to look at the window of the bus to see if he was still there, but I didn't notice anything. Once again, I would love for the story to end there, but no, still not finished with this guy apparently. I live near a hospital, and to have access to it, there is a climb and a traffic light just before. The bus I was in had already passed the traffic light, and was at the top of the climb when I saw his car and his gaze at the traffic light. He was looking for me. I thought to myself, well, I'm in deep crap, and I really had to move my ass and find a good plan so that when I got off the bus, he wouldn't see me, follow me, and get me. As soon as I got off the bus, I had to run, and I did, hugging the wall of fears that he would see me. I saw his car at the intersection of the bus stop, and I hid behind a four-wheel drive parked in front of me. I hid there while waiting to see where he was going, not seeing me. He must have told himself that I was still in the bus as he continued to follow the bus. I could see blue car creep pulling away in the distance following the bus. I ran home, and when I crossed my gate, I stood in front of my front door for more than 10 minutes. I was shocked by what just happened, and I asked myself the famous question of, if he had seen me behind the four-wheeler, what would have happened to me? His strategy was actually to follow the bus and watch everyone who got off, in hopes that I was one of the people, so then he could block me with his car and get me. This whole situation, it really scared the hell out of me, and now, each time I walk by this bus stop area, I get chills down my spine. I always have the fear that this guy is going to reappear. I think I'm clearly traumatized by blue cars at this point. Every time I see one, I just can't help but blench and stress. So, dear blue car creep, let's not meet ever again. So, I have to keep this very general, but I have to share it. It's a long post, and I'm a first-time poster, so please be kind. Also, please keep in mind that I was 22 years old, and not even out of grad school when all this went down. I'm a therapist, and while I was in grad school... I began an internship that provided group and individual counseling to a halfway house. And this halfway house was run by a church, and their well-meaning congregation, but was a bit of a mess. After several months of working with them, I got a call from the house parent that said none of the residents were willing to attend group sessions if their new housemate would be involved. The house parent made some comments about a typical house drama, so I wasn't too worried about it, and just told them to go ahead and bring the residents to the clinic, and that I would work with the new housemate privately to figure out what was going on. I met with the new housemate first, and they seemed a bit reserved and untrusting, but nice. When I asked about issues in the house... They gave a small, curved smile and 
raspy chuckle scoff. I pushed them a bit further, but all they would say was that the others were scared. We ended our session, agreeing to meet weekly. I had the group session next, new housemate not included, to get the feel with what was going on from the others. When I walked in, I could tell that there was something seriously wrong. Their faces looked terrified. Their general appearance were disheveled, and they were all looking anxiously around at each other. I asked what was going on, and no one answered. They asked me what I thought of the new housemate, and I redirected back to them. The anxious eye contact continued. I asked again and reminded them that change and growth could not occur without honesty. Finally, one of them started talking, and here is the story from that perspective. We were told that we were getting a new housemate, that we weren't supposed to have much interaction with, and that they wouldn't be there long. No one would give us any info about why the new housemate would be getting the only private bedroom, or why they wouldn't be participating in class or group activities. And they just told us to leave them be. This went on for two weeks. Then, they started letting the new housemate hang out and participate in things. They would make some strange comments that would make us uncomfortable, but we would just ignore them. They wouldn't sleep. They would always leave their bedroom after they thought everyone else was asleep and go into our rooms to check if we were actually asleep by holding their fingers under our nose. Then, they would leave and walk through the backwoods. They would always be quiet in the morning, and we would tell the house parent, but would be told to be quiet and not talk about this with anyone. One night, after dinner, we turned on the Investigation Discovery Channel, and a new housemate was watching with us. A few minutes into the episode, they got up and walked into the woods. They usually did this super late at night. A few minutes later, we heard it. Their name on that episode. We couldn't be sure, so we went to the computer and checked, and, and we saw that they had tortured and murdered several women. Now, there's more details to the story that I can't share, but needless to say, my new client was a convicted serial killer that raped, tortured, and murdered at least three women in our area. This person was being let out on a technicality that affected several of the murders they were charged with. So, they got released early on the condition that they would live under supervision. This particular halfway house was being paid to hold this person, until a more appropriate structure was in place. After I had done my own research and confirmed... I went to my supervisor and professor, and the contract with that particular church and halfway house was terminated. Icing on the cake? The next year of my life was absolute hell, as I was stalked, my home was invaded, my dogs injured, my house and car vandalized, and survival items that didn't belong to me were found in my attic that made it look like someone had been living there. I would come home, and the house would look different than the way that I left it. The police came over to my house a dozen times throughout that year, and they did nothing. So, my family hired a security team and installed cameras. Six months later, a perpetrator was arrested on my property, and eyewitnesses and evidence linked him to the crimes perpetrator had been out of prison for just over a year on rape and kidnapping charges. Guess who was from the same small hometown as the man arrested? My client. An edit. Here are some answers to a lot of the questions. This incident was just over 10 years ago, and the stalker is still in jail. I had just bought the house the week prior to all this starting, so I couldn't move somewhere else. No money. Several friends offered to let me stay with them, 
but police and the psychiatrist believe that the stalker would follow me because he was already fixated on me. I have no idea if that's how it worked, but I listened to them. My brother, dad, and several friends rotated, staying with me for several weeks. There was no evidence of a connection between the stalker and the serial killer, but my brain sometimes begs me not to believe that. I lived in that house alone for another three years, and then got married and lived there for two years after with my husband. I never felt at rest in that home, obviously. We were in a new home now, and with the help of lots of dogs, cameras, home security, and a really good therapist, I'm doing great, though I do have severe night terrors from the PTSD. The reason I was told that they weren't stopping the serial killer from walking was because they were about to be transferred, and the house didn't want any big scenes or drama when the person was going to leave. Whatever. In terms of who this person is, I left out and changed up a bit to major details that would be easily googled to find out who they are, so happy hunting. I still think about this encounter as an adult. When I was about 10, I'm 25 now, I was downstairs watching TV late at night with my mom and my sisters. Everyone decided to head off to bed, and I was left alone downstairs. I started drifting off, and all of a sudden someone started banging on our door. Hard. I'm talking let me the F in hard. I was so scared that I just sat there frozen, staring at the door, like my life depended on it. My dog was laying right next to me and also just stared. He never barked or moved an inch, which was odd because he always barked at the door. The banging never stopped for what seemed like a solid five minutes, but in reality was probably only a minute. I looked at my dog, and I think because I finally moved, my dog snapped out of his trance. He looked at me for a split second and jumped up and ran towards the door. He still didn't bark, but instead started turning his head like he was confused. I finally got the courage to get up and open the blinds to see what was going on, and this young woman, maybe around 20 to 25, was standing there, holding her chest in her hand. It was still attached to her, but it seemed like she was trying to hold them up to keep them from being out there, I guess. She had blonde hair, white skin, and she was covered in blood. Her shirt was ripped and her hair was a mess. I remember thinking that she might have gotten beat up or was in a car crash. Either way, I immediately went to go open the door. As soon as I went to unlock it, my mom out of nowhere slammed her hand on the door and relocked it. I had no idea that she had even come down the stairs let alone walked up behind me. I was so focused on the door and on this woman that when she slammed her hand, it was almost as if it knocked me back to reality. Reality of not opening the door for strangers in the middle of the night. I looked up at her, and I could feel my eyes were wide, and I think I even started crying. She put her hand on my shoulder and moved me away from the door. She yelled, Who is it? through the door, and the girl yelled back that her boyfriend had beat her up, and they lived in the apartments across the street from us. Mind you, we lived in a townhouse in a cul-de-sac. Our unit was all the way in the back where you would start to turn. We were the first unit in the row, but where she pointed out her and her boyfriend's place was at was quite a ways from that. You'll see how I know that in a minute. My mom asked her name, and she said something that sounded like something-any. Maybe 
Bethany or Stephanie or something like that. I saw my mom hesitate to open the door, but after she yelled, please help me, my mom opened the door, stepped out, and pulled it closed to shut, but not completely shut. I cracked the door behind her to make sure she was okay and also to see what was going on. The woman that we'll call Bethany kept thanking my mom and asking to come in because she was scared her boyfriend was going to come after her. My mom refused and explained that she couldn't let her in because of the safety of her four kids, but said she would sit out there with her. My mom yelled at me to grab the phone and call the police, so I did. My mom started asking her what happened and what specific unit she lived in. She pointed toward her specific one and told my mom the building number in her unit, B. A silver SUV pulled up a little later, and she ran towards it yelling, That's my sister, and then just jumped in. The car sped off without another word from her or a single word from the sister. My mom looked back at me confused and came back inside and shut and locked the door. We just stood there and looked at each other. I asked my mom what about the police and she said she would wait for them downstairs if I wanted to go to bed. I was too scared to leave her, so I waited with her. Once they arrived, my mom explained what happened and the officer said she did the right thing by not letting her inside. The weird thing? My dog never barked once, until the cops knocked on the door. They also explained that they had been receiving similar calls like this in the area recently. Even worse, we all packed up to go to the grocery store, and as we passed that building, you could tell the apartment was empty like no one had been living in it. Maybe they just didn't have any furniture, but it was still weird. He never came after her that night, and we never saw her or the SUV again. So, Bethany, uh, Stephanie, I hope you're okay, if this was real. But also, if it's not, don't ever knock on my door again. This has been a fantastic collection of terrifying encounter stories. A huge thank you goes to everyone who listened, and of course, the original posters of these stories. Obviously, these are terrifying situations that no one wants to end up being in, most of them to no fault to the original poster's own. Um, I do want to say that these stories are intended to be as educational as they are entertaining, and if anybody is able to learn something from these and potentially keep themselves out of a dangerous situation, then they have done their job. Once again, thank you to everybody who listened and everybody who enjoyed. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. And subscribe if you're new. Hit the bell icon, etc., etc. You can also follow me on all my social media platforms or support over Coffee Patreon or channel memberships. All patrons and channel members get early access to content like this. Thank you to everyone out there. I want you to know you are valid, you are loved, and you are important. Never let anyone tell you otherwise. Sleep well.